Hello, my name is Jaru, and today I'm talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. In this video, I will be discussing the difference between a narrative and a meta-narrative within the context of video gaming. I will also be discussing how the idea of the player being a part of Deltarune's narrative is not only incorrect, but would be explicitly bad for Deltarune if it were true. Now, if hearing me say that makes you want to rush to the comments to leave a scathing remark, then please wait and listen. The idea of a meta-narrative in a video game is complex and niche, which means there's a good chance that what I mean when I use the term and what you think I mean are not one and the same. As such, I merely ask that you give me a chance to explain myself before you go roasting me on social media. But before we dive in, I'd just like to leave a quick call to action regarding my Kofi and Patreon. Bills are getting higher and higher in the Jaru household, so if you'd like to support me and keep the channel up and running, please consider donating through either of these platforms. Kofi is good for one-time donations and rewards you with fun donation goals, such as blind playthroughs of games chosen by you guys. On the other hand, Patreon is a good way to support the channel more consistently, and it allows you access to the occasional behind-the-scenes content and sneak peeks on my videos. If everyone watching this video could donate $1 per month on Patreon, then I'd never have to worry about missing my rent payment ever again. Anything you can donate would be greatly appreciated, and even if you can't, I'm still quite grateful for you watching my content. I may be begging for money, but don't think I've forgotten just how much y'all've done for me already. Thank you all very, very much. And with that said, let's talk about why the player is not a part of Deltarune's narrative. Firstly, we need to define what it is we are talking about. What is the difference between a narrative and a meta-narrative? Well, that depends on what medium of art you are looking at, and it also depends on who you ask. But this video is not about art history. This is about Deltarune. So instead of arguing semantics regarding what a meta-narrative quote-unquote really is, I'm just going to give the terms my own definitions so that way we are perfectly clear regarding what it is I'm saying. A narrative is simply the plot of a game. It is what the fictional characters in their fictional world are getting up to. Where things get confusing is with the idea of a meta-narrative. Now, to be clear, when I refer to Deltarune's meta-narrative, I am not talking about the game's themes. A theme, for those not aware, is a central idea in a piece of literature that recurs throughout the story. For example, Undertale has pacifism as one of its core themes, but that's not what I'm referring to when discussing the meta-narrative. For the purposes of this video, the term meta-narrative will be defined as follows. A narrative or plot that is focused on or heavily emphasizes the relationship between the player and the video game. Now, you may be wondering, how is this different from a regular narrative? Well, let's take an example. In Super Mario, the narrative of that game is that Bowser has kidnapped Prince Princess Peach and Mario needs to save her. That is the plot of the game. It has nothing to do with the player or our relationship with this game. The player may control Mario, but we are not acknowledged within the story. As far as Mario, Peach, and Bowser are concerned, the player does not exist and is not relevant. In other words, this game has a regular narrative, but it has no meta-narrative. This is pretty much the norm for most video games. but that does raise the question, what is the opposite of that? What is a game where the regular narrative is nearly or completely absent while the meta-narrative is the main focus? Well, a great example of that is The Stanley Parable. The narrative of this game is borderline non-existent. You play as a man called Stanley, who steps out of his office to realize that all of his co-workers have gone missing. Your goal is to discover what has happened to them. You know this is your goal, because the disembodied narrator tells you that is your goal. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. 
The narrator comments on everything you do and every choice you make, often sarcastically. Doing anything other than following the plot of his story will result in him mocking you. However, his plot and his story are paper thin, and the game knows it. If you look out the windows, it's just a white void. If you go down alternative paths, you can end up in places with unfinished developer textures. Heck, if you piss the narrator off enough, he might just kick you out of his game altogether and force you to play Minecraft instead. This is because the Stanley Parable is purely focused on its meta-narrative. The plot of Stanley and his co-workers does not matter. All the game cares about is messing with your expectations of what a video game experience should entail. It is a comedy first and foremost, with the target for its humor being all the tropes in and around video games. This is a great example of a game that has zero interest in telling a conventional story. Heck, even though you play as Stanley, the narrator talks to the player directly most of the time. In one iconic moment, if you go AFK in this broom closet, then the narrator will sarcastically remark that the player must have died. He'll then call out loudly for some other player to remove your corpse and continue playing the game. There are, of course, other games that focus on a meta-narrative without being a comedy. The horror genre in particular has been a popular popular spot for developing meta-narratives. Games like I'm Scared pretend to hack your computer and force you to interact with game files, just to give an example. The Stanley Parable and I'm Scared are very different games, but in both cases the main appeal is how these games play with your expectations by directly involving the player in the story. One is a comedy while the other is a horror, but both emphasize their meta-narrative. That said, I'm sure you're asking what any of this has to do with Undertale or Deltarune. Well, you see, Toby Fox did something rather unique when he developed Undertale. While there have been games in the past that have integrated meta-narrative elements, they usually fell into one of two categories. Either A, they only poke the fourth wall a little bit and instead mostly focus on a regular narrative, or B, they focus almost entirely on the meta-narrative while largely ignoring or excluding any sort of normal plot. Prior to Undertale, there were very few instances of games meeting in the middle, which is to say there were very few games that had both a solid regular narrative and a meta-narrative at the same time. This is what made Undertale so unique. However, at first glance, this idea doesn't seem logical. How can you have both a narrative and a meta-narrative? Aren't they mutually exclusive? Either your story is about fictional characters or it's about the player's relationship with the game. How can it be both? Well, you see, that's what's so clever about Undertale. In order to blend narrative and meta-narrative, Toby Fox took regular video game mechanics and integrated them into the lore of the world. Case in point, saving and loading. In a normal game, saving and loading is a mechanic that does not exist in universe. When you reload your save file, it is largely accepted that this is not a power that your character actually possesses. It is not part of the narrative, it's just a game mechanic. But in Undertale, Toby made saving and loading diegetic. Diegetic means that it is occurring in the narrative and can be observed or experienced by the fictional characters. For example, Flowey used to have the power to save and load, but now the player and our character Frisk have that power instead. At the same time, saving and loading still works the same way it does in any game, allowing the player to reload old save files. But by making it both a game mechanic and a part of the plot, Toby has overlapped the narrative with the meta-narrative. As a result, anytime Flowey talks to you about saving and loading, it can be interpreted in one of two ways. Either he's talking to Frisk about the in-universe power of saving and loading, or he's talking to the player about the game mechanic of saving and 
and loading. In effect, Flowey is simultaneously taking part in a regular narrative about Frisk and a meta-narrative about the player. That is the magic of Undertale. Toby stacked two separate narratives on top of each other and had us experience them simultaneously. And this layering is not limited to saving and loading. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Case in point, throughout the game, Flowey implies that we are using a stolen soul to interact with the world of Undertale. However, what this means depends on which narrative you are looking at. In the regular narrative, he's implying that the ghost of Kara has possessed Frisk's body. But in the meta-narrative, he's implying that we, the player, have possessed Frisk instead. This is made doubly meta by the fact that Kara is the only character who we name in the game, and we are expected to name them after ourselves on account of us being tricked into thinking that we are playing as Kara. As a result, in the regular narrative, Flowey calling us Kara is him accusing us of being controlled by his dead friend. But in the meta-narrative, Flowey is calling us by our real life name. This is because Kara represents both the fallen child and the player. This is why us meeting Kara in the No Mercy route is such a mind screw. We are effectively meeting the character who embodies us in the world of Undertale. It's no wonder this encounter is only possible after we've effectively destroyed the world. We have to break the game in order to meet ourselves. And this sort of fascinating double layering of narrative and meta narrative is found throughout Undertale. At any given time, you can read the story through either a narrative or meta narrative lens, which is what makes this game so fascinating to experience and analyze. However, there is a catch to all this. You'll notice that, unlike in something like The Stanley Parable, which actively comments on its own narrative, Undertale keeps its narrative and meta-narrative separate. When Flowey is talking about saving and loading, he's either talking about the in-universe power that he once possessed, or he's talking about the game mechanic. He cannot be talking about both. He's either in the narrative or he's in the meta-narrative. You can only interpret it as being one or the other at any given time, as they are fundamentally separate concepts. We experience them at the same time, but just as a fictional world and the real world are different things, Undertale's narrative and meta-narrative are different too. Ultimately, the player has to choose which narrative to focus on. Determination is either a physical substance that exists in human bodies, or it's a psychological attitude. Attribute. Saving and loading is either a superpower or a game mechanic. Kara is either a dead human child or a stand-in for the player. Both narratives are present, but they do not bleed into one another. There is a line between them. This divide allows the player to experience Undertale completely within one narrative or the other. You don't have to interpret any of the plot as being meta if you don't want to. There is a full story about fictional characters in a fictional world in this game, and you can enjoy that story in its entirety without ever contemplating the meta-narrative. You may forget about the meta-narrative in order to get invested in Alfie's and Undyne's relationship, only to completely forget about the regular narrative as Flowey corrupts the game's intro in his boss fight. Having both types of narrative is fun and unique, but understanding the barrier between the two narratives is crucial if you want to understand understand what Undertale is and how it works. It is this separation of narratives that is at the heart of this video and at the heart of Deltarune. You see, we must now talk about a little phenomena called the willing suspension of disbelief. What is the willing suspension of disbelief? Well, Wikipedia defines it as the avoidance of critical thinking and logic in understanding something that is unreal or impossible in reality in order to believe in it for the sake of enjoying its narrative. To put it in simpler terms, we know that fiction is not real and does not matter. We know that starships and wizards do not exist. However, when we choose to engage with fiction, we also choose to forget all those facts so as to allow 
allow ourselves to enjoy the story. This is part of an unspoken contract with the author. They provide us with entertainment, and in exchange, we engage with their story and enjoy it as if it were real. I know that a fictional character dying does not matter and should not affect me, but since I've chosen to suspend that fact in order to enjoy the story, that character dying does matter and does affect me. The willing suspension of disbelief is simply our choice to care about something fictional in spite of the fact that it is fictional. In the case of video games, this consists of us forgetting that we're playing a game in order to get invested in the story. However, there's a catch. You see, part of this unspoken contract is that the author promises to keep their story believable and consistent within its own internal rules. If it violates these internal rules, then our suspension of disbelief can be damaged or destroyed, and if that happens, we'll stop caring about the story. This doesn't just extend to stuff that doesn't exist, either. It also includes things as basic as human nature. If a character acts in a way that no real person would, that alone can threaten our suspension of disbelief. But wait, I can hear you say, what is the point of all this? What does any of this have to do with Undertale or Deltarune? Well, remember how the suspension of disbelief is all about forgetting that we're playing a game in order to get invested in the story? Well, what do you think happens when we introduce a narrative that's all about bringing attention to the player's relationship with that game? In other words, what happens to the suspension of disbelief when you introduce introduce a meta-narrative? The answer is quite fascinating. You see, when you look at prominent meta-narrative games like The Stanley Parable or I'm Scared, you start to realize that they don't particularly care about the suspension of disbelief. This is because you only need that suspension if you are expected to get invested in a fictional world and its characters. But in the case of pure meta-narrative games, they don't care about their regular narratives. They only want you to focus on their meta-commentary. We see this in both of the games I just mentioned. The Stanley Parable is a comedy. Its main goal is to make you laugh, and you don't need to be invested in the world of Stanley's office building in order to be amused by the narrator's commentary. I'm Scared is a horror game, and horror has always had different expectations than other kinds of stories. In a horror video game, it's less important that the world be consistent and believable than it is to just be scary. Gamers who love indie horror can attest that things like atmosphere, tension, and unique gameplay are far more important than the world being believable. I'm Scared doesn't care about your suspension of disbelief because it doesn't need your investment to scare the daylights out of you. In short, we can see from both of these games that having a meta-narrative does undermine your player's suspension of disbelief. But because meta-narratives are compelling, even without that suspension, it doesn't matter that it has this effect. The Stanley Parable is still funny, and I'm Scared is still scary, even if you're made aware of the fact that they're just games. They both achieve their goals because they put all their eggs in the meta-narrative basket. However, this raises a tricky question. These two games dodged the issue of suspension of disbelief because they don't care about their normal stories. But what about games that do care? How do you deal with the downsides of a meta-narrative without completely sacrificing the regular narrative? How did Undertale keep audiences invested in fictional characters while also entertaining us with meta-commentary. What is its secret? The answer is that Toby Fox did put both a regular and meta-narrative in Undertale. But unlike The Stanley Parable or I'm Scared, Toby did not force the player to acknowledge Undertale's meta-elements. Remember, Toby wrote the game so that it can be viewed as both a regular narrative and a meta-narrative. But as a result of this, it also means you don't have to pay attention to the meta-elements if you don't 
want to. You can ignore the meta aspects of saving and loading and instead just view it as a superpower that your character happens to possess. This extends to all of the game's meta elements as I explained earlier. In effect, by not shoving the meta narrative in our face, Toby avoids the downsides of having a meta narrative in the first place. The meta narrative is optional and thus the game gets all the benefits of its clever commentary without sacrificing its fictional world or the player's suspension of disbelief. It's a genius bit of writing that played a big part in Undertale becoming the smash hit that it is today. However, as interesting as all that is, you may have noticed that I've yet to talk about Deltarune. Well, don't worry, this all had a point. You needed all this context in order to understand how Undertale works and the dangers that it faced by having a meta-narrative. It strikes a brilliant balance, but it could have easily shattered our suspension of disbelief if it hadn't been so careful. Understanding the tightrope that Undertale walks is crucial to the discussion surrounding Deltarune. So, now that you've been briefed, let's actually talk about it. Deltarune is a direct follow-up to Undertale. It features the same art style, core gameplay, and many of the same characters and themes. It's not a sequel to Undertale, but it is described as a parallel story to it, implying there's some connection between the games. This overlap extends to its approach to meta-narratives, but whereas Undertale was focused on saving and loading and how the player wields godly levels of power over these fictional worlds, Worlds, Deltarune goes in the opposite direction. Undertale has one save file, dozens of different endings, and the ability to kill or spare almost any character. Deltarune has multiple save files, only one ending, and you can't kill almost anybody. Both games have a meta commentary focused on the player's relationship with these worlds, but they are exploring different aspects of that relationship. Undertale is about those games where we wield great deals of power, while Deltarune is about those games that railroad us towards one specific outcome. Having these games explore similar yet opposite ideas is really cool, and I think we can all agree that this should lead to another fantastic experience. However, where things get divisive is with the reveal at the end of Chapter 1. At this point in the game, Chris rips out their soul, puts it in a cage, and goes off to do unknown activities. Not only do we stop controlling them at this point, but we are specifically forced to notice that we can still control the soul even after it leaves Chris's body. What this shows us is that Chris is a separate entity from us, and given how violently they removed their soul, we can guess they aren't too happy about us possessing them. Them. Now, at first glance, that seems all well and dandy. It's a cool mystery that we get to explore in future chapters. What could be so divisive about that? Well, you see, this is where fans started reaching a rather specific conclusion. Namely, people started concluding that the main focus of Deltarune will be about how Chris is possessed by the player. And do you know what we call a narrative that is largely focused on the player's relationship with the game? That's right, it's a meta-narrative. In other words, many fans have concluded that Deltarune will mostly or entirely focus on its meta-narrative, just like the Stanley Parable and I'm Scared. But wait, didn't we just establish that Undertale doesn't work that way? In that game, the player also controls a human, but who is controlling Frisk depends on whether you look at the narrative or the meta-narrative. They're either possessed by Kara or the player. This distinction, as you'll recall, was integral to maintaining the suspension of disbelief. If the meta-narrative was a required part of the plot, that would force us to acknowledge that it's just a game, and thus would shatter our emotions version in Undertale's regular narrative. The barrier between the two narratives was critical to that game's balance. There are, admittedly, a few moments in Undertale that could be read as breaking down that barrier, namely when Flowey asks
asks us to not reset, and when Kara talks to us directly, but those moments happen at the very end of the two main routes, when the game is wrapping up. It doesn't do any harm to our investment to bring down the barrier when the credits are already rolling. However, for 99% of that game, the barrier stays firmly in place, and that's the only reason that Undertale's regular narrative is able to function. But if the main focus of Deltarune is that the player is controlling Chris and there's no other way to interpret this scene, then that is problematic. If this really is the central concept, if the meta-narrative is being shoved in our face, then that threatens to shatter our suspension of disbelief. Now, that would be fine if Deltarune was a game that didn't care about us being invested in its fictional world, but anyone who has played the first two chapters can tell you that is very much not the case. Toby Fox clearly wants us to be invested in the lives and stories of these characters. The majority of the first two chapters is spent on their completely regular narrative. As such, we are left in a pickle. If this scene can only be interpreted as being a part of the meta-narrative, then that throws the entire regular narrative into the trash. We can't be reminded that we're playing a game and forget that fact at the same time. As such, that leaves us with two options. Either A, Toby Fox has lost his touch and accidentally ruined the plot of his game, or B, there is a regular narrative explanation for this scene, and the barrier between the two narratives that he achieved in Undertale is still present in Deltarune. This divide between these two options is where I ended up pretty quickly when I first started analyzing Deltarune. Undertale is my favorite game of all time, thus I had complete faith in Toby Fox's writing skills. That meant I had no choice but to conclude that option B must be the correct one. The barrier must still be in place, so while the player was controlling Chris in the meta-narrative, some other character would have to be possessing them in the regular narrative. With that conclusion reached, I then published my video titled What is Ralce, in which I gave my theory on who was possessing Chris. I would then reiterate this idea that some entity other than the player was involved with Chris throughout many of my later videos. However, it was at this point that I started to notice a strange pattern, both in my comments and on social media. People really didn't seem to agree with my conclusion that some other entity was possessing Chris. They dubbed this idea Third Entity Theory, a title which came with a heaping pile of skepticism attached to it. They framed this idea as being some convoluted conclusion that made the story more messy, and thus wasn't likely to be true. This baffled me, of course, but at this stage I couldn't quite articulate why my conclusion was not only logical, but downright necessary for the plot to function. It wasn't until I released a video called The Gaster Files that I finally understood where me and the community were miscommunicating. In that video, I mentioned how Gaster couldn't have stolen my real life soul because that would be applying a narrative to my life that I know isn't true, which would shatter my suspension of disbelief. This was a fairly minor part of that video, and I didn't think think much of it at the time, but because it was so early on in a video focused on Gaster, it was something that a lot of people saw. Shortly after, I released a video where I ranked Deltarune fan theories in a tier list, and throughout that video I frequently mentioned how I didn't like a lot of the theories focused on the player's role in this story. That was because most of these theories were working from the perspective that the player controlling Chris was the only possible interpretation interpretation of this scene. However, because that video was unscripted, I failed to effectively articulate why I didn't like those theories. That was partially because this is a complicated topic that is hard to explain, but it was also because I assumed me and the community were broadly on the same page. Oh, how wrong I was.
After the release of these two videos, I noticed a whole new brand of negative comments on YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit. People heard me say how the player can't be the one possessing Chris, and took that to mean that I was just too stupid to understand the idea of a meta-narrative. They thought I was insisting on there being some other entity possessing Chris because I couldn't conceive of the idea of a meta-narrative focused on the relationship between them and the player. Or even if I could conceive of it, I couldn't understand the worth in exploring such a narrative. It was at this point that I finally realized what was causing this miscommunication. I had reached the conclusion that there had to be this separation of narratives so early on in my theory crafting career that I just assumed it was an accepted fact. I didn't realize that the importance of suspension of disbelief was something that needed to be discussed discussed, much less explained. So when a sizable chunk of the fanbase labeled me as crazy and quirky for suggesting someone other than the player was possessing Chris, I didn't really get their perspective. I thought my logic was fairly sound, so the people saying it didn't make sense or didn't fit Toby Fox's writing style seemed rather irrational to me. It's only now that I understand people thought that idea was so insane because they thought I didn't didn't understand or didn't believe in the idea of a meta-narrative. In a moment of absolute irony, by not overtly discussing the intricacies of the suspension of disbelief, I actually damaged people's opinion of my own media literacy. It is for all these reasons that I have made this video. I need the community to understand my point of view, and why Deltarune focusing primarily on a meta-narrative would be problematic. I need you all to see that while meta-narratives have always been a core part of Toby Fox's work, having it be an undeniable part of the regular plot is not how he rolls. He layers the two narratives on top of each other, allowing people to engage with one or both depending upon our preferences. That is why some fans love Undertale purely for its world and characters, while others love it for its meta-narrative about how people interact interact with games. Undertale is a buffet where you can pick and choose what you want to engage with. It is not a three-course meal where eating the meta-narrative is a required chore. And Deltarune, in my opinion, is clearly the same. There has to be a regular narrative explanation for everything that occurs in Deltarune, as otherwise that regular narrative falls apart. I'm fine with people disagreeing with my theories or ideas, and I I don't want to come across as condescending by explaining all this, but when the miscommunication between us gets so bad that people think I'm brain dead, that's when I have to draw a line and start explaining things in exhaustive detail. With that said, you may have some issues or concerns with this entire line of thought, so I'll try and preemptively answer some of those concerns now. When you hear me say that Flowey can't be talking about the narrative and meta-narrative at the same time, that may inspire a knee-jerk reaction of, why not? If a real person could understand the subtle nuances of these two narratives and discuss both simultaneously, then why can't Flowey? The answer is, maybe he could. Flowey is, in many ways, a parallel to the player. He could save and load, he played through every route, he feverishly uncovered every line of dialogue, and he now just views the world as shallow and uninteresting. He exhausted the game of its potential, and now he wants something new. So the idea that he has become self-aware of his world's status as a video game and now looks at it through both a narrative and meta-narrative lens is a completely valid interpretation of Flowey's character. However, whether or not Flowey is aware he's in a video game is unimportant for the purposes of this video. When I said Flowey has to be talking about one narrative or the other, I meant that from a player investment standpoint, not from a literal in-universe character standpoint. Flowey knowing about the meta-narrative is a matter of debate, but what is not a matter of debate is the effect a meta-narrative has on a player's 
investment in the regular narrative. By bringing attention to the player's existence, you force them to detach from their investment in the fictional world. As such, the only way to keep people invested in the fictional world is to either not have a meta-narrative or to keep the meta-narrative optional. That's what I meant when I said Flowey has to be talking about one narrative or the other. I purely meant that the two narratives must be separate, and not that Flowey is incapable of understanding the true nature of his world. However, that brings us to the second argument I can see people making. I keep claiming that the regular narrative suffers if the meta-narrative is the main focus, but how do I know that is the case? Where is my proof? Are there any cases of a game with both types of narrative that fails to achieve the balance that Undertale did? The answer is yes. I do in fact have evidence of this very thing, and that evidence is called Doki Doki Literature Club. There will be major spoilers for this game, so skip to this timestamp if you don't want to hear it. Doki Doki Literature Club, or DDLC, is a dating simulator that focuses on the main character preparing for a school festival alongside a couple girls from his literature club. The narrative is focused on you befriending these girls and ultimately picking one to form a romantic relationship with. However, a couple hours into the game, this whole narrative has the rug yanked out from under it as Monica, one of the girls in the club, becomes self-aware. She now knows that she is a fictional character inside a video game. This knowledge drives her to begin editing the game's code in order to force the player to be with her. She wants this because everything else in her world now feels hollow and unimportant, and only the player feels real. Now, DDLC is a pretty popular indie horror game, and it's certainly commendable for doing something rather unique with its genre. However, it does have one rather crucial flaw that tends to be brought up by critics, specifically with regards to the regular narrative. While people universally liked the meta-narrative focused on Monica, the regular narrative focused on the literature club is somewhat looked down upon, not because it's problematic, but because it's un important. The main focus of DDLC is on Monica's meta-narrative, so having to spend several hours pretending that this game is a normal dating simulator feels rather pointless. Why waste the player's time on a regular narrative that doesn't matter by the end? Why spend several hours on what amounts to filler content when all that actually matters is the stuff revealed after the Monica twist? This criticism became even more pronounced with the DDLC. DLC re-release, which added a bunch of new side stories. These side stories were entirely based in the regular narrative of the DDLC world, and explain how these girls met and became friends. However, many fans found this rather underwhelming and uninteresting, as it was just building upon a world that ultimately gets thrown away. The problem with DDLC, as you likely guessed, was its failure to balance its narrative and meta-narrative. While the girls from the literature club are nice and it's cool to learn more about them, it's sadly impossible for many gamers to care about them and their stories. This is because our suspension of disbelief has been shattered by the meta-narrative taking center stage, and with our investment in the fictional world destroyed, it's difficult if not downright impossible to recapture the interest of those players. All they're interested in now is the meta-content. So adding non-meta content is pointless to them. This is the price that DDLC paid by forcing a meta-narrative onto the player. It doesn't matter how fleshed out, likable, or sympathetic the fictional characters are if the player's investment in that fiction has been undermined. Hilariously enough, Monica's story perfectly encapsulates the danger of integrating a meta-narrative. Monica's entire character is focused on her losing investment in the fictional story of her world due to her becoming aware of reality. And if being made aware of the meta-narrative undermines Monica's investment in the story, why would the player be any different?
it is this scenario that Deltarune runs the risk of facing if it chooses to focus on a meta-narrative. If it's revealed that this scene really can only be read through a meta lens, that will do horrendous damage to the game's reputation. For context, DDLC is a really short game. The main story is only four hours long. Yet even with that brief length, critics were still annoyed at having to waste one or two hours on the regular narrative. By contrast, Deltarune is over seven hours long with just the first two chapters, and it's projected to be at least 20 hours long by the end. If wasting one or two hours was enough to irritate people, then imagine how they will feel when we spend dozens of hours developing a narrative that is ultimately thrown away. People would be outraged. Not only did the game get us invested in these characters for no reason, but it also wasted our valuable time. If all this happens, not only would Deltarune fail to surpass Undertale, but its quality as a game in general would be called into question. That is the timeline we are looking at if this scene is purely meta in nature. That is also why I don't believe it. I have far too much respect for Toby Fox as a writer to believe he would sabotage his own game like this. As such, given the options of A, Deltarune being ruined by a poorly thought out meta narrative, or B, Chris being possessed by someone other than the player in the regular narrative, I'm going with option B. And hopefully, after explaining all this, you viewers at home will too. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. To be honest, it is such a relief to finally understand the source of this confusion. You can only have so many people accusing you of being media illiterate before you start to get concerned. But I understand now, and hopefully with the release of this video, I will have successfully cleared up this confusion. It's fine for Deltarune to have a meta-narrative focused on the player's relationship with Chris. Not only is it fine, but it is explicitly what is going on, and I am not denying that. Where I draw the line is with regards to the distinction between narrative and meta-narrative. Just as saving and loading has both a regular and meta-narrative explanation, I am simply insisting that Chris being possessed must be the same way. I personally think they're possessed by Asriel in the regular narrative, but I'm absolutely open to other ideas. The only issue I take is with people insisting the player is the only character possessing Chris, while completely ignoring the consequences that would have for the narrative. I am open to other people's ideas, and I am not so conceited as to think I'm the only one capable of discussing or understanding these concepts. All I want is for the community to be on the same page and to be able to discuss these topics in a respectful way. Hopefully this video will have taken a step towards that goal. I've got a bunch of other videos, blind playthroughs, and lore playthroughs coming down the pipe, so I hope y'all are excited for that. I especially hope my patrons are excited. My never-ending thanks go out to all the people supporting me financially on Patreon. A special shout-out goes to E-Roll, Stephanie Klein, Suit Number One, Aspen Frost, Leo Dragon Tamer, and Limping Penguin. Oh, and a last minute thank you to Tibby Fitzhugh as well. An extra special shout out goes to Super CKX7 and Fluff for supporting me on the Ralsei tier. And a last minute addition in editing, a huge shout out to Spindrift for being the only big shot willing and able to support me on the Spamta tier. I am super grateful for all your support and I hope I can continue to be worthy of it in 2024. And with that, I say it's time for me to sign off. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you've got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.